Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, where we take up important articles of the day from the newspaper and discuss them in detail as per the demands of civil services exam. Articles covered today are displayed on your screen and their notes in PDF and Word format are provided in the description box down below. Without further ado, let us begin. Now starting off with the first article of the day, which appeared on page 7 of today's Hindu newspaper. This article highlights how the state of Kerala, despite having a range of welfare, health and literacy scheme for migrant workers, the state lacks a broader policy that addresses the social justice for the migrant labour community. This article, however, deals with the migrant labour issue for the state of Kerala. For today's discussion, we will take an overview of state of internal migration throughout the country and what are the issues that affect migrant labour population. This topic is important from GS paper 1 point of view, which deals with population and associated issue. Further, in GS paper 2, UPSC asks about welfare schemes, vulnerable section of the population by centre and states and performance of these schemes. This topic is also important from exams point of view, which we can see from this mains PYQ of the year 2015, which asks us to discuss the changes with respect to trends of labour migration in the country. Now, the census defines migrant as a person who resides in a place other than his place of birth or the one who has changed his or her usual place of residence to another place. Now, there are two data which highlights the size of migrant population in the country. The first is 2011 census data, which estimates about 450 million internal migrants in India. Further, the economic survey of the year 2017 identified 139 million seasonal or circular migrants who dominate the low-paying, hazardous and informal market jobs in key sectors of economy. The seasonal or circular migrants have markedly different labour market experiences and they face integration challenges than more permanent migrants. However, the precise data and systematic accounting of their experiences are not available with the government itself. Hence, in the scope of today's discussion, we'll first take a look at the reasons for why does the internal migration happen, following which we will discuss the issues that affect migrants in the country, followed by interventions which are taken by the government. In the end, we will discuss what else can be done in order to facilitate this migration and to ensure the welfare of migrants in the country. Hence, let us start off with the reasons that affect migration. The primary reason that affects the migration pattern in a country are economic reasons. There are two factors that determine economic reasons. The first is a pull factor. Pull factor signifies that the attractiveness of more developed area pulls the migrant away from their homes towards these developed areas. As developed areas have better opportunities for employment, also there are higher wages when you get employed in more developed areas. Also, these areas offer better amenities, hence, these are the reasons why migrant labours are attracted towards developed areas. The second reason are push factors. These factors pushes a migrant away from their home because of certain reasons. F the first is that in less developed areas, the primary source of employment is agriculture. However, this is faced with lower level of incomes. Hence, persons who want higher income, they shift away from these underdeveloped areas. Also, in less developed areas, per capita availability of land is low, which makes farming a non-remunerative economic activity. Also, there are lack of basic facilities such as housing, sanitation and infrastructure, which pushes migrants away. Also, less developed areas have fewer opportunities for employment. Hence, 
a larger section of the population remains unemployment. Also, less developed areas have fewer alternate source of income and hence due to non-availability of income sources, a migrant is pushed away from these non-developed areas. Further, there are socio-cultural factors as well, which include cultural and entertainment activities which are available in urban areas. These act as a source of attraction for migrant workers. Further, in developed areas, the migrant workers has a less probability to face caste-based discrimination. Also, there are family conflicts in less developed areas, which forces a person to migrate to another place. Also, due to improved communication facilities, it has acted as a source of attraction for migrants that in case they live away from their homes, these communication facilities will enable them to keep in contact with their family members who live away from their place of work. Also, better developed areas offer improved education opportunities and these act as a source of attraction for migrant workers. There are other factors as well, such as political instability is less in developed areas and these areas also have a better law and order situation, which favors the development of economic activities in these areas. Now that we have dealt with the reasons that affect migration in our country, let us take a look at issues that internal migrants in our country face. The first issue that internal migrants face is that of non-portability of entitlements for migrant workers and it is further aggravated due to absence of identity documents with migrant workforce. Also, there is an absence of reliable data and this is because lack of realistic statistical account with the government of the number of migrant workers and lack of understanding of the nature of migrant workers' mobility. Further, a large portion of migrants, they hail from marginalized groups such as scheduled caste and scheduled tribes and this adds an additional layer of vulnerability to their urban experiences. Further, these migrant workers face exploitation at the hands of their employers and contractors which are in form of non-payment of wages, physical abuse and accidents and the existing legal machinery is not sensitive to the nature of legal disputes in the unorganized sector. Further, there are lack of access to education for the children of migrant workers and these aggravates the intergenerational transmission of poverty in India. Further, there are lack of housing infrastructure in a country, which means that there are greater pressures to accommodate more people in urban areas. Hence, these migrant workers are forced to live in slums. Further, these migrant workers, they face social exclusion as the local language and culture of urban areas are different from their original culture. And hence, they face harassment at the hands of local people. Also, there is an impact on health of migrant workers in a country because factors such as patterns of mobility and poor work and living condition, they negatively impact the health condition of migrant workers. Also, migrant workers in a country face lack of political participation in the area of their employment. As interstate migrants, they cannot exercise their voting rights because Voting in India is determined by one's inclusion in the local constituency's electoral role. And the process of enrolling is time consuming and has no relevance for seasonal migrants. Thereby, they face exclusion from political participation. However, the government of India and state governments have undertaken several interventions in order to make the lives of migrant workers better. What are these interventions? Let us take a look in the next slide. The first and most important intervention by the government was that of One Nation and One Ration Card Scheme, which ensures the distribution of highly subsidized food grain through a nationwide portability of ration cards and the operationalization of biometric authenticated 
point of sale transactions at and state levels also there is a pradhan mantri shram yogi mandhan scheme which ensures protection for old age and social security for unorganized sector workers also government has made efforts to educate the children of migrant workers for example the project changathi of state of kerala which is implemented as a literacy scheme to target the migrant children so that they can learn the language of malayalam also the government of india introduced the ayushman bharat scheme which was launched in the year of 2018 which is fully financed by the government the benefits of this scheme are portable across the country which means a beneficiary can visit any impaneled public or private hospital in india and avail a cashless treatment further the government introduced the garib kalyan rozgar abhiyan which aims to boost employment and livelihood opportunities for migrant workers who return to villages in wake of covid-19 pandemic it involves skill mapping of migrant workers and it linked women with self help groups further there are few legislative measures as well these include the interstate migrant workmen act of year 1979 the building and other construction workers act of the year 1996 and the code of social security of the year 2020 which has few provisions for interstate migrants now what can be further done to improve the welfare of migrant workers in india let us take a look in the next slide the first measure includes the need for coherent legal and policy framework on migration as there is a need to mainstream migration in a comprehensive and focused manner in policy documents and national development plans this can be achieved through design of targeted components and special outreach strategies for migrants within the public service and government programs also there is a need to ensure ground level implementation which can be done by prioritizing the implementation of existing labor laws further there is a need to sensitize and train the policy makers local government officials ngos employers and financial institutions regarding the obstacles that the migrant face in accessing of public service additionally there is a need to fill knowledge and research gaps as this will enable the evidence based policy making in a country this include revising the design of census and surveys to adequately capture age disaggregated data on migration patterns in a country further there is a need to conduct detailed country wide mapping of internal migration further there is a need to improve the institutional preparedness and build capacity of these institutions this can be done by building capacity of panchayats which will maintain the database of migrant workers and it will help establish vigilant committees to identify the entry of new migrants at local levels further by establishing migrant labor cells in each state it will help support the labor ministry of the central government also there is a need to create inter district and inter state coordination committees which will jointly plan institutional arrangements between administrative jurisdictions of sending and receiving areas to ensure proper service delivery to migrant workers in the end there is a need to devise a universal national minimum social security package for migrant workers which will include complete portability in terms of registration as well as premium which will be paid by government on behalf of migrant workers hence to conclude we can say that since migration has a cross cutting sectoral impacts multiple and complementary interventions by different ministries and departments are needed which will facilitate the migration and ensure that migrants are integrated into economic social political and cultural life of our nation this is all for today's discussion on internal migration 
Now moving on to the second article of the day which appeared on page 14 of today's Hindu newspaper. The Reserve Bank of India had constituted an interdepartmental group which was to review the position of rupee as an international currency and it framed a road map for internationalization of Indian rupee. Now this group has recommended various measures to accelerate the pace of internationalization of Indian rupee. and today's article discuss the benefits and challenges of such a move the use of indian rupee for international transaction is important from gs paper 3 point of view as it describes the effect of liberalization on domestic economy this topic is also important from mains point of view which you can see from this pyq of the year 2014 which asked a question on foreign direct investment Similarly in the prelims of the year 2015 a question appeared on convertibility of indian rupee hence in the scope of today's discussion we will first take a look what is an international currency and how rupee internationalization will affect the indian economy then we will take a look at initiatives which were taken by the government to promote the use of rupee for cross border transactions then we will discuss the benefits of internationalization of indian rupee followed by the challenges that the domestic economy might face then in the end we will discuss a way forward so what should be done in order to promote the internationalization of indian rupee as of today the us dollar is the world's most widely accepted currency for international transaction the share of the us dollar as an invoicing currency is 3.1 times more than uss share in world exports and 4.7 times of its world's import now an international currency is supposed to perform three international functions first it acts as a store of value which means that the governments can use them in their international reserves further it also acts as a medium of exchange that is an international currency can be used for invoicing of trade and in financial transactions thirdly it acts as a unit of account which means these international currencies are used as an anchor for pegging local currency and for denominating trade and financial transactions in the early 1960s even the rupee was accepted as a legal tender in countries such as qatar uae kuwait bahrain Oman and Malaysia but today almost 86% of India's imports as well as 86% of India's exports are invoiced in US dollars hence there is a need for internationalization of Indian rupee now internationalization of Indian rupee is a process that involves increasing the use of local currency in cross border transactions internationalization of rupee will increase the use of indian rupee for invoicing and settlement for cross border transactions further it will also lead to freedom for non residents which will enable them to hold financial assets and liabilities in indian rupee also the non residents can use indian rupee for tradable balances at offshore locations now the government of india has taken several initiatives which is done in order to promote the internationalization of indian rupee what are these measures let us take a look in the next slide now in india the broad framework for cross border transactions is governed by the foreign exchange management act or fima of the year 1999 this act replaced the foreign exchange management act or fima and this signifies a shift in india's approach from that of conservation to management of foreign exchange and this act has helped in significant growth of india's exports and capital flows further to strengthen the india's role as international financial center the government and the rbi has taken number of initiative towards internationalization of rupee these include promoting the cross border borrowing in indian rupee by introduction of rupee denominated bonds 
or masala bond since 2014 it allows an indian corporate to issue rupee denominated bonds in overseas markets further rbi has also promoted trade settlements in indian rupee and the biggest development came in july of 2022 when rbi issued a comprehensive framework which allows trade settlement in rupee through a special vostro accounts further india has signed 23 currency swap agreements since 2018 with other nations which includes uae as well as sarc grouping which is done in order to promote internationalization of indian rupee also there are other measures as well which includes exploration on domestic currency use for regional trade settlement at asia clearing union the second measure was by enabling condition to link domestic rupee interest rates and currency markets with offshore rupee markets the third measure was permitting primary dealers to act as market makers in forex markets which was done in order to improve the market liquidity now after we have covered the initiatives that were taken towards internationalization of indian rupee let us take a look at benefits of such a move the first benefit that it reduces the foreign exchange requirement which is done in order to stable the balance of payment also it reduces the dependence on foreign currency for trade purposes the second benefit that it reduces the vulnerability to external shocks because of reduced dependence on foreign currency the third benefit that it mitigates the currency risks for indian enterprises by eliminating the foreign exchange fluctuation thereby reducing the cost of doing business and hence supporting the global growth for indian enterprises also this move enhances the india's global stature and respect by helping the indian businesses through increased bargaining power for example post global financial crisis chinese efforts to internationalize their yuan currency has helped its increasing global stature and thereby a similar move for indian rupee will enhance india's global stature as well there are some other benefits as well first of which that it lowers the transaction cost of cross border trade and investment also it improves india's current account deficit because of the reduced trade costs the third benefit is that it facilitates trade with other countries that are under global sanctions such as iran and russia and promotes trade with currencies who are facing forex shortages such as sri lanka also internationalization of indian rupee helps overcome hazards of moral policing from western countries for example usa has severed russia's access to dollar assets which has affected india's trade with russia but internationalization of indian rupee will help india to pay for russian imports through use of indian rupee however despite having several benefits internationalization of rupee face several challenges what are these challenges let us take a look in the next slide the first challenge that internationalization of indian rupee faces is that it may complicate the domestic monetary policy by limiting its effectiveness and independence rbi's ability to control domestic money policy and influence interest rates as per domestic macroeconomic conditions also internationalization of indian rupee increases the refinancing risks by aggravating the pass through risk of external stimulus to domestic financial markets for instance during a phase of global recession the non residents can convert their rupee holdings and thereby move out of indian economy also such a move heightens the exchange rate volatility in case inflation rate is higher than the global rate or from uncontrolled flow of capital it goes against the prerequisite of price stability before the internationalization of currency as inflation is higher than the global rate which undermines the use of a currency as an international medium of exchange also it increases the responsibility of india 
to maintain the international financial and monetary order that is it increases the burden on india to play the role of lender of last resort to the world economy however there are several moves that are aimed to improve the internationalization of indian rupee what are these moves let us take a look in the next slide now internationalization of rupee has significant benefits but to achieve it successfully it would require some prerequisites the first is that it requires developing a deep domestic financial market and its infrastructure which will include efficient markets for funding and risk transfer which is a precondition to effectively absorb external shocks also there is a need for effective management of capital inflows through right combination of policies macro prudential regulations and market interventions for example in capital flow hierarchy the foreign direct investment is least risky which is followed by equity investments followed by debt capital so the first focus of policies and regulation should be on debt flows also there is a need for increasing the acceptance of rupee as currency for reserves that is currencies which are held by other countries for example over 7.5 trillion dollars of us securities are held by various nations in august 2022 also there is a need to increase india share in global merchandise and commercial services trade which will help rupee to gain acceptance as a global currency now the interdepartmental group has held that overall benefits of internationalization far outweighs the concerns hence in accordance with its terms of reference the interdepartmental group has recommended a road map in order to achieve rupees internationalization these include inclusion of indian rupee in sdr basket of the imf which is an international reserve asset created by imf to supplement the official reserve of its member countries further it also requires recalibration of foreign portfolio investment regime in order to accelerate the pace of internationalization the interdepartmental group has also recommended designing a template and adopting a standardized approach for examining the proposal on bilateral and multilateral trade agreements for invoicing settlement and payment in indian national rupee and local currency hence by deepening the domestic financial markets effective management of capital inflows and increasing the acceptance of indian rupee as reserves indian rupee can be used as a global currency for payment for cross border mechanisms this was all for today's discussion on internationalization of rupee now moving on to the third article of the day which appeared on page 10 of today's hindu newspaper this article goes in detail about cabinet's nod to data protection bill as data protection bill will be introduced in parliament soon hence it will be covered in subsequent editions of daily news simplified now for today's discussion this article reports that the data protection bill will also include an amendment to the rti act which has raised concerns because it will also prohibit the government department from sharing the personal information and the activists they argue that government departments may refuse to share information that could hold the public office holders accountable hence the right to information act is important from exams point of view as in gs paper 2 upsc mentions important aspect of governance with respect to transparency and accountability also in the previous year question in mains of 2020 a question appeared on right to information act hence in the scope of today's discussion we will first take a look at what is an rti act then we will discuss the exemption which prevents disclosure under this act further we will also discuss the hurdles in implementation of rti act followed by the steps that can be taken in order to overcome these hurdles let us start by knowing more about the rti act now the rti act of 2005 makes the governance citizen centric which is done by equipping them with the power to seek information from public authorities 
It also provides with a mechanism for grievance redressal so that the citizens who are denied information can seek redressal under the provisions of these act. Further, an RTI applicant is not required to give any reasons for seeking information. Also, Section 4 of the RTI Act mandates public authorities for proactive disclosure of certain information like functions, structures, powers and duty of its officers and employee financial information. Also, the Act makes certain authorities responsible for supplying information. Now, public authorities designate some officers in their administrative units as public information officers or PIOs and these PIOs are mandated to supply information within 30 days of seeking information or 48 hours if the information sought concerns the life or liberty of a person. Also, there is a two-tiered appeal mechanism under the Act. If the information sought is not provided within the specified time, then the RTI applicant can file appeal against the decision of PIOs. The authority for first appeal lies with the public authority itself. The first appellate authority happens to be an officer, senior, in rank to the central public information officer. Whereas the final appellate authority or the second authority is the center or state information commission which is a statutory body that has a chief information commissioner and is assisted by not more than 10 information commissioners. And these commissioners are appointed by president in case of center and governor in case of state respectively. Now, this act also provides for certain exemptions from disclosure of information. What are these exemptions? Let us take a look in the next slide. The first set of exemptions are provided under the Section 8.1 of RTI Act, which provides exemption for information under following conditions. In case such information prejudiciously affect the sovereignty or integrity of India, or such information which is expressly forbidden by any court of law. Also, an information is denied in case it causes a breach of privileges of legislature or it is a commercial confidence, trade secret or an intellectual property. Further, an information is denied in case it is available to a person in its fiduciary relationship. Also, information is denied in case such information is received in confidence from foreign governments or such information will endanger safety of a person or if it will impede investigation process. Further, Section 9 of RTI Act prohibits disclosure of information whose copyright is not with the state itself. Whereas, Section 24 of the Act exempts information which is related to security or intelligence organizations. However, despite such provisions, the implementation of RTI Act faces certain hurdles. What are these hurdles? Let us take a look in the next slide. The first hurdle that the RTI Information Act faces is that there is a low public awareness. According to a PricewaterhouseCoopers study, only 15% of respondents were aware of the RTI Act and the awareness level is low among the disadvantaged communities such as women, rural population or marginalized section of society. Further, there are constraints in filing the application, which includes non-availability of user guides for information seekers, non-standardized application forms, non-friendly attitude of public information officers or inadequate efforts to receive applications through e-governance means. Further, the information provided through RTI Act is of poor quality, which either is incomplete or lacks substantial data. Also, in many cases, there are failure to provide information within the statutory requirement of 30 days. Public officials face certain challenges, which is due to inadequate record management procedures, which is further aggravated by lack of enabling infrastructure. Also, the public information officers are inadequately trained, which is a big challenge primarily due to huge number of PIOs to be trained, frequent transfers 
and of huge constraint with respect to availability of training resources. However, there are several steps that must be taken in order to overcome these hurdles. What are such steps? Let us take a look in the next slide. The first step that can be taken in order to improve the implementation of RTI Act is by making the application process more user friendly. As appropriate governments and public authorities need to design the RTI process keeping in view the needs and convenience of its citizens. Also, the use of digital technology should be promoted. Hence, the records that are required to be catalogued and indexed in manner that the entire data should be available through a centralized system which uses advanced technologies such as big data for data processing. Also, there is an immediate need for investment in infrastructure. As the ARC report had mentioned that the government may allocate 1% of the funds of flagship program for a period of 5 years in order to improve the infrastructure requirements for RTI Act. Also, there is an urgent need for an external agency in order to train the PIOs and potential of non-profit organizations to carry out training in official or non-official capacities can be trapped by appropriate government and training institutes. Also, in order to reduce the burden on public information officers, there is an inherent need for promoting proactive disclosures under the Section 4 of RTI Act. Hence, by making the process more user-friendly, using digital technology, investing in infrastructure, hiring an external agency for training, and making proactive disclosures, we can improve the implementation of RTI Act. Hence, this was all for today's discussion on Right to Information Act. Now moving on to the last article of the day, which appeared on page 14 of today's Hindu newspaper. This article reports that the PMI reading has slid from 61.2 in the month of May this year to 58.5 in month of June. And it indicates that the service sector output has grown at its slowest pace in three months. Now, such indexes which measures industrial activity are important from exam's point of view, which you can see as UPSC in GS paper 3 highlights Indian economy and issues relating to growth. Further, in the mains of year 2014, a question appeared on shift from agriculture to industry and PMI index signifies such industrial development. Also, in the prelims of the year 2020, a question appeared on consumer price index. Hence, in the scope of today's discussion, first, we will discuss what is a purchasing manager's index. Then, we will discuss significance of such an index with respect to gauging the economic activity of our country. Towards the end, we will take a look at differences between the Purchasing Manager's Index and Index for Industrial Production or IIP. Now, PMI is an indicator of business activity, which indicates both manufacturing and service sectors. It is calculated separately for manufacturing and service sectors and hence a composite index is thus constructed. This index follows a service based measure that asks respondents about changes in their perception of some key business variable from a month before. The PMI is derived from a series of qualitative questions. Executives from reasonably big sample running in hundreds of firms are asked about key indicators such as output, new orders, business expectations, and employment. A figure above 50, it denotes expansion in business activity, whereas anything below 50, it denotes contraction. Now higher the difference from this midpoint, greater is the expansion or contraction. And the rate of expansion can also be judged by comparing PMI with that of previous month's data. If the figure is higher than the previous month, then the economy is expanding at a faster rate. If it is lower than the previous month, then it is growing at a lower rate. Now what is the significance of such index? The PMI is usually released at the start of the month, much before the official data on industrial output, 
manufacturing and gdp growth is available hence it is considered as a good leading indicator of economic activity and the economist who consider the manufacturing growth which is measured by pmi as a good indicator of industrial output and central banks of many countries also use the index to help make decisions on their interest rates further the pmi also gives an indication of corporate earnings and is closely watched by investors as well as bond markets a good reading enhances the attractiveness of an economy vis-a-vis other competing economies and hence increases the inflow of foreign currency into a financial market now what is the difference between a purchasing manager index and an index of industrial production as these both are an indicator of manufacturing activities let us take a look in the next slide now there is a significant difference between purchasing managers index and index of industrial production the first difference is that in terms of publisher as pmi is published by nikkei whereas the index of industrial production is published by national statistical office of government of india also the pmi does not track the actual production whereas the index of industrial production tracks the actual production the coverage of pmi is also limited as it covers only 500 private companies while on the other hand the iip covers the private sector as well as the public sector undertakings in india however in terms of coverage pmi is wider as it covers both manufacturing and services activities on the other hand iip is limited only to manufacturing activities in the end the pmi is not used for gdp's calculation while on the other hand iip is used for gdp calculation and it accounts for activities of unorganized sector hence this was all for today's discussion on purchasing managers index